Yeah, so what are we talking about when we're talking about turbocharging uh, your Scrum? So a turbocharger is something that gives you extra power, but they give you sometimes what's called free power because it's unlike a supercharger, it does not require the engine's power to drive it. So the turbocharger is something that's almost free. And that's how we view the potential of adding Kanban to Scrum. It, it, one of the big misconceptions we see in the market is this positioning of, should I use Kanban or Scrum? And the reality is it's a really uh, an inappropriate question because it's not an either or, or situation. Um, Kanban is an approach for improving your process. And if you're, it's, it always is a case of starting with what you do now. If you're currently doing Scrum, then Kanban is an approach which can be used on top of Scrum to make your Scrum better. And essentially, this is what we're talking about uh, with a turbocharger. So we can improve your team's performance um, without costing a ton of energy. And why is this an issue is because we see that there's a lot of challenges in the world with Scrum imp implementations. Uh, and in fact, uh, from Josh Sutherland, over 58% of Scrum implementations are late over budget with unhappy customers. This is, it's not to say that Scrum is bad. There are actually a lot of people that are doing exceedingly well with Scrum. And even, even some of the Scrum implementations, they, what we see commonly is people get some immediate, uh, some value uh, when they go to a Scrum impl uh, implementation of Scrum. And then they often will stall out um, and they, they just sort of hit that plateau and aren't able to take it to the next level. And this is where, really, where we see Kanban can really help. We've seen this um, repeatedly where um, Scrum implementation stalled out and we start implementing Kanban uh, practices, general practices on top of Scrum. Uh, we don't break the Scrum. Um, and if you, eventually you might, um, no longer be doing Scrum, but if, at the beginning, you're always starting with what you do now. And um, the key is to get uh, improvement. And that's what we go for in, in the Kanban method. So one of the we see is common problems with change is so things like the sponsor can leave early, um, the scope is too big, and the organization struggles because it's too large of a change. And, and there's pain that, uh, that is taken on because it's uh, unable to actually recover from that big change. Uh, trying, big challenge is trying to take on too much too soon. Um, the change can be unclear. You know, we, we've got too many things going on, or this is a third or fourth time we're doing it. Um, or it's been forced down on it, really don't have buy-in from everyone. So these are some of the, change, the challenges we see. Um, anyone have any other ideas of, or things that they've experienced in terms of uh, challenges, um, implementation and change, perhaps resistance that they've encountered? And just throw them out in the chat. Keeping up with the practice, that's a good one. Any others? Bad habits? Or habits that just don't change. That's another challenge yeah. for sure. Yeah. Being stuck in a rut. Right. Ceremonies and administrative duties. Yeah. Anyone, anyone encounters the problem where you dutifully hold the retrospective, but nothing ever happens. Oh, that's good. Don't blindly follow Scrum. Try to adjust according to product project needs. That's common sense. Feeling right? over, yeah, feeling overwhelmed. That's a great one. Lack of psychological safety in terms of the change itself. These are great. So Todd, do we want to move to the next uh, item here? Yeah, I'm thinking maybe you take this one because this one's got builds on it. It's going to be easier to you take it. <laughs> got it. No problem. So Todd and I tag team a lot of people. So this is kind of us just doing our thing here. So, okay. So, um, you know, we've got these, these kind of things that we're talking about with change. And you can talk about, for example, different agendas, lots of psychological safety type things. That was a great one, by the way, for psychological safety, because I think what we want to assume in some ways from really a change perspective is that we think, hey, we want to increase our capability in some way. That's going to take some time to do that, right? We want to maybe uh, in the Scrum world, maybe we want to increase the the number of story points we take on, or we want to possibly reduce the number of defects that we have coming out of our environment. So that's a capability thing, right? And we like to assume that in some way, that's going to take a certain amount of time. Let's say two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, maybe two months. And so we think it's going to be pretty linear. We think, hey, from A to B, this won't be too hard for us to do. It's a pretty logical thing to say, we're gonna do a few things to change how we're behaving and then suddenly, boom, we'll be where we need to be. But the reality typically is more uh, something a little different. So the reality can be something a bit more like this. We're cruising along, we introduce this new change to what we're gonna try and do. Uh, for the Scrum people who do software development, let's assume test-driven development is the activity here, or maybe limiting how much you do. Either way, this is a change you're introducing. And so you're gonna find yourselves basically dipping down in terms of capability. What you could do before is now actually even harder to do with this new thing that you're adding in. So you have this dip, and I saw someone here, uh, Lynette, call it about uh, the J-curve, right? Yeah, so this is typically what's called the J-curve in sort of the science realm. Uh, and basically what's happening is 
you're losing um, a bit of safety here. So you're basically taking away what was normal and you're kind of making things a little bit riskier for people. They don't feel as safe. They feel like things are challenging now. They're harder. And this requires patience as well for them to bear through it and get through it and really develop that new habit or to adopt that new practice or that new behavior. Uh, so now we're running into problems because right over here on the right side, there can be failure. Uh, I'm assuming some of you have been around some of these things before where they say, hey, let's take on this new thing and then you fall down trying to take it on. Some of you probably have been involved in larger scale changes inside organizations, like let's do Scrum for like eight different teams and no one really knows quite what to do to begin with. They try to do it and they may fall back. Uh, for example, I said test-driven development, that could be the same thing as well. We're testing, trying to get test-driven development set up, but we're falling down occasionally here and there. It's hard for us to get started basically. And so we decide effectively to roll back. We give up on this change and we sort of lose that momentum and we still hold on to that lack of safety sometimes. We see that happening from time to time as well. In terms of turbocharge, Todd, do you want to jump into this part right here and kind of play with the, the information? Yeah, so so given that we're going through a change and going through an a key part of the Kanban method is the idea of evolutionary change, managed evolutionary change. We start with what you do now and we make small incremental changes. And the whole idea of the small incremental changes is really to, to minimize the two impacts of the, of the J-curve. Um, by making them small, we're not encountering so much risk. And also by making them small, we, we make them happen over a much shorter period of time. So this is a Kanban practice. There's a number of Kanban practices, core, core approaches in Kanban. And all of these are things which can be used, many of which are entirely complementary with Scrum, uh, but then can also take it further. And this is where the turbocharge comes in. So with the Kanban method, we talk about six key areas, six general practices that are key to the Kanban method. Um, one of them, making policies explicit. Uh, this is common to many people in a firm world, such as uh, things like definition of done. But we, we make the point that we make as many of our policies explicit. So we know how the, the, the um, service delivery is happening. And it describes how the team and team, team of teams are working together in order to um, make their service delivery happen. A visualization, of course, many people uh, mistakenly believe Kanban is only about visualization. Uh, visualization is a key part. We want to unhide things. We want to make things as visible as possible. And not just the, the board, which has the Kanban board concept um, that many people think they're using Kanban because they have a Kanban board, but visualization beyond that, making metrics visible. Everything that we can, in fact, also making the policies explicit includes including them in the visualization. Many of uh, our high recommendation is to make those policies part of uh, the board so that they can be reviewed regularly. Limiting work in progress. A key part of Kanban is limiting the work in progress along the flow uh, of the work. And the key reason for this is if we limit work in progress, we can have very predictable systems. Kanban systems can be incre incredibly predictable. Uh, one of the things that surprises people who have come from a Scrum world is that in the, in the Kanban, it's, it's very rare, uh, it, it's frequent to not involve uh, estimation of any sort, uh, any, any upfront estimation. And um, this is, many people have been trained to feel that estimation has to happen. Well, the reason that Kanban can work this way is many multiple. One is because we limit work in progress to get predictability. And we also um, manage the flow and have metrics in order to understand what our system is actually producing. So by collecting information about how the system is performing and by focusing on the flow of work, so that's the managing flow, the fourth general practice, that's how Kanban is able to really handle that very smoothly and have very high predictability. Certainly the more mature teams, the more mature Kanban teams are able to, to significantly improve their uh, predictability. Uh, the fifth one, Feedback loops, making sure that we're gathering feedback, gathering feedback from the board, gathering feedback from metrics, gathering feedback from uh, many of the uh, meetings and uh, reviews that we hold, the cadences that we call them in Kanban. This provides the feedback, uh, and then we have to do something about it. Uh, the doing something about it is what closes the loop. You have to take those acts of leadership to act on the feedback appropriately. So it's actionable feedback, taking action, and using that continuous feedback in a mode of collaboration and experimentation. So we collaborate and experiment using the scientific method, which fundamentally is based on feedback loops in order to come up with experiments and design of experiments that guide our evolutionary change. And if the experiment is turns out to invalidate our 
hypothesis, we roll it back. If it turns out that it validates it, we continue it and we try a new one. And we make these small changes over and over again uh, in order to continuously improve and establish an environment of continuous improvement. So in a nutshell, this is the, the essence of uh, what we're trying to do in the Kanban method. Obviously, there's a lot of depth behind this. These are the general practices. And behind each of these, there's a lot of detailed approaches that, that we use in the Kanban method uh, for implementing these. But all of these can be applied in small changes in order to, to essentially turbocharge your Scrum. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. So, um, Todd, I'd like to hop over here. And folks, I'd like to share with you an example from the field of what turbocharging looks like uh, from a company called Posit Science. So uh, at Posit Science, uh, it's a company or was a company at this point. I think they're still around. Uh, they were started by one of the most uh, preeminent neuroscientists, uh, digging into something called neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. You might have seen some stuff like this before in the recent years or an exercises that really can improve the way your brain works. Uh, and they had built a product and they were trying to build it effectively and they needed Scrum in this case. They went to Rally uh, and Rally said, hey, we want you to use Scrum to basically build the product. So they said, okay, let's do that. And during this stealth period of development, they actually sat down and started using typical stuff from Scrum, all the good details, all the sprints, all the even task estimations to really build out uh, their product. And so they were building it uh, and got it released, but they ran into some problems once they released their product. Uh, they kept coming in with late breaking work uh, into the Scrum team. So kind of a common problem that we see happen a lot is that the Scrum team is focusing, focusing, delivering, delivering, and then suddenly uh, we see uh, last minute things pop up that the team needs to deal with. Uh, and when the team went back to the, the coaches, uh, the coaches said, look, you've really got to do Scrum right. You've got to avoid uh, this late breaking work. You've got to delay it in some way. But they couldn't. They realized that they had to adapt uh, to the market itself and to the changes in their environment. So along this time, uh, someone comes in to consult with them. Uh, uh, and they discuss, hey, what's going on here? What's really taking place? The project manager meets with a guy named David, and they start to kind of dig through what could be happening here. And so they meet with the customers, uh, the product owners, and beyond the product owners, and ask them, hey, what's going on? Why are you dissatisfied with the current situation? Because something doesn't quite feel right. And they said, look, the stories we're giving the development teams, the, the scrum teams, they're not being finished. The deadlines are actually being missed as well. They keep kind of kicking the can down the road. So that was something that was really frustrating to them. On the team side, the team was full of scientists, actually, uh, scientists who were trained in PhD in neuropsychology and neuroscience. And their job was to sit down and figure out how to take these really interesting concepts of brain plasticity and move them into video-based games. So the product itself was actually a, a game-level type experience where you sat down and you went through a simulation to retrain your brain, commonly used for things like um, peripheral diseases or peripheral issues as you age. You can't see cars around you. This was to help improve your peripheral vision quite a bit. That was one example of what the product would do. So the team was full of really smart uh, scientist level people. Uh, and they said, hey, we're getting pulled away in many directions. We're getting fragmented effectively in terms of our focus. So we don't like that at all. And they said, we're being constantly asked to do task-based estimates, which doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense to us because they're oftentimes inaccurate. And they take a lot of time for us to go through and think through how we're going to actually do this work. They said, we'd rather just simply build this thing and see what happens. So from this conversation, both parties agreed to a couple of changes. Uh, uh, and those changes were uh, changing from the task level to user story. So I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you guys probably end up using user stories or something like that. Uh, some of you have probably used t-shirt sized estimation before. Uh, so they said, hey, how why don't we why don't we do that? Why don't we get rid of the task and move it up to the user story level? And then also on top of that, because they said they were fragmented so much, the everyone agreed on the team side why don't we actually do a per person whip limit, which means a work in progress limit, which is the idea that basically we have so much work that we've committed to, why don't we have a limit on how much we as individuals focus on that way we don't become overloaded and focusing on too much at the same time. And that's what led to this kind of design right here. So you can see they've got effectively a uh, Scrum board more or less, a little bit more than a typical to do doing done, but they have the pending, the specify, the sprint backlog, they have their workflow for building stuff uh, right after that, which is dev, build, test, deploy. And then they finish with the done column there. So on the left side, you see the backlog. On the right side, you see user stories. But you'll notice with their visualization, they do something kind of fun here. They actually have little icons to indicate where they're focusing, where they're putting their effort. So you can see where DE is listed, both for item R, I, and E. Uh, so you know where DE is paying attention. With PB, for example, you can see that they're doing R&D. 
Uh, and then down there on the bench side in the bottom left, they're kind of hanging out, really available to do a little bit more if they wanted to. So here's uh, the example of the turbocharge they use. They use this whip limit idea. Uh, again, we were talking about uh, earlier setting up policies. That's kind of the area. And inside one of these policies, they said, how about we actually put a whip limit on how much we do individually? So turbocharge number one right there. And turbocharge number two is simply, hey, collaborate on stuff. It's not just for you to own and finish. You can actually work together. So make sure that you're working together as a team. And if you need help, raise your hand. Or if you feel like you have room to do something, raise your hand. Something really simple like that changed the dynamics internally inside the team where they felt more cohesive as a team. So really powerful effects right there. Now, they did this for about six to nine months. That's all they changed in how they work. Uh, this was something that they decided to do. They felt like much more than that was just too much. So they said, hey, how about we add in this, that, or the other? For example, let's just say, because I'm going back to test-driven development so much today, let's just say that they had such suggested, let's do test-driven development. They probably would have said that's too much. So they actually said, this is just enough for us to get balanced again, to really try and deal with the late breaking work, but also kind of stay focused at the same time. So they decided uh, to wait six to nine months. Uh, but what they found was that the decisions they made, the turbocharges they made, really didn't get them a whole lot of relief from feeling overburdened. Uh, it gave them a really strong sense of what to say next. They actually had a better context in which to express their frustrations. So something we do in Kanban uh, that I showed you guys a second ago was this idea of the dissatisfactions. So we typically go out and look for that. We say, hey, what are the problems you have? So they ran it again. This guy named David came back and sat down with the project manager, the team, and the, uh, the uh, customers as well and said, what are the challenges you're running into? Now the customers had more to say. They said, hey, look, still, the stories aren't being finished, the deadlines are being missed, but now we're being told you're too busy to discuss new work. So the team is actually not allowing us to engage with them anymore, as much, more or less. So this is a big problem for them. And then on the other side of it, with the actual team itself, the team said, hey, we know a lot now. We understand our situation a lot more, and we have a lot more frustrations and issues to describe, to describe here. So they said, we have too much context switching. Uh, some of you might know what that is, where you just jump from one thing to the next and you're not really staying focused and delivering as well. So they had learned about context switching as a challenge for them. They now had a better, stronger visualization, I think, that told them they had too much work in progress. We were saying They were saying yes to too much, basically. Uh, and they said the planning work that we're trying to do is actually disrupting our focus. It's awfully cumbersome. Usually for them, planning would take almost two days to get through uh, because there was so much in the backlog to chew through. And they often found that the clinical testing that they did, they had to do clinical testing as part of their work because uh, anything uh, medical, and this was considered medical, actually had to go through clinical testing for uh, FDA approval here in the US. And they said the workflow for that clinical testing is really unbalanced. Sometimes there's nothing there, sometimes there's too much there, and we can't get testing done. So we feel like testing is, is not reliable in this case. And then there was a massive workload at the start of each sprint. So they felt that pressure that a lot of uh, teams can feel sometimes. So they've put a lot in the backlog for the sprint, and suddenly they feel like there's just so much there for them to get through. So they felt like there was a lot of pressure to go, 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 and not necessarily focus the way they wanted to. And then they said, even though we're committing to this work, sometimes the stakeholders change their minds. So we're saying yes to this, and now they've changed the priority for what they want to do. Because the market's shifting on them, because they're trying to grow the business, they're finding problems there as well. So they're finding this constantly shifting picture around stakeholders. And then from the product owner side, the product owner, when they actually say, I want this, and the team delivers it to the product owner, the product owner is not accepting the stories. They're just not getting around to it. They're doing other work. So they're like, we need their attention because basically we have a bunch of things that don't have feedback on them. We don't know if it's been validated or not by the product owner. So there's a big problem there in terms of actually having a nice running smooth flow of work. So they had plenty of issues, plenty of pain. And so they decided to make some changes this time around. Uh, they said, hey, why don't we try and actually reduce the context switching? Why don't we reduce how much we said yes to? Basically reducing the work in progress. Let's try and get a steadier workflow between the testing side of things and the deployment side of things, because they're the ones that are really causing some issues here in terms of smoothness of flow. And also in terms of the massive workload at the start of each sprint, can we do something to reduce that? What are the techniques? What are the options we have to maybe change that? And then last but not least, can we get clearer priorities from our stakeholders? So that was kind of the set of goals they had in mind. And this is sort of how they started to address it. So they threw in some ideas, basically turbocharges, right? They said, instead of uh, trying to do iterations, 
they said, why don't we switch to a flow approach and use a service level agreement? So why don't we just start to just pull stuff and not worry about the actual um, time box around it? And they said, instead of doing sprint planning on a schedule, we'll do it per feature. So instead of trying to do everything at one go, they said, hey, feature per feature, we have room for a feature, we'll actually start to try and then do the planning around that. And then for the demo and retrospective, they said, instead of doing it you know, based on that time box approach, we'll just put it into a calendar. So if we have stuff to work on, uh, stuff to demo, we'll demo it. If we have uh, time to retro, we'll retro basically. So about every two weeks, they still run a retro. And I wanna say about every two weeks, they would do a demo if they had something to demo. Estimation wise, they said, we'll estimate by the feature or by the SLA. Uh, and then in terms of the workflow, they kind of pulled that apart a bit more and they still kept the per person whip limit. So a lot there uh, for them to try and, and do now in terms of turbo charges. And so this is what it looked like physically as a board. This is back in the day when we didn't have COVID and we all met in person. So they actually had a physical board on a wall and they had uh, features per team. So one team, team A, team B, team C, they each had their own feature to pull from a backlog of potentially 10 features to choose off of. So at the very top, number one there, that's the very first feature they'd like, the, the, the product owners would like the team to pick. Team A, B, or C could pick that feature and then bring it over. And so they have this entire list of things they could choose from. In a second here, we'll talk more about what that really means. So you can see here, they have the top 10 list. They have something called cost delay that we won't talk about today, but uh, some of you may know about that. They use that as well, another turbocharge. They had dots that told them about the dependencies on the work. They had a clock that told them how much longer that work was in progress. So one of the things they did to kind of mitigate the demand challenge is they said, we're gonna use an SLA clock, which meant that we're going to have things done in 21 days or less for a piece of work. That meant that, for example, if team B is working on something and they've been working on it for 20 days, they now have one day left to finish that feature. And I'm going to show you in a second what that looks like, but you can see that that feature is sitting there. It's got one day left. They know they need to really finish off that feature as much as they can. There's also this idea of intangible work that we have sometimes. They said, hey, we might want to do stuff that's maybe valuable, but we're not sure if it's going to provide a lot of value. And that's what those two blue stickies are about. Uh, basically, that allows for some flexibility there. So there's a lot of flexibility on the left side of this board where people can say, I'm changing my mind. They can take number 10, move it to number one. They can take number four, move it to number one. They can really play with that as product owners and stakeholders. That's really good in that case. Uh, everything is assumed to be sized at 21 days or less. This is constantly a learning process here. And right here is something that's on fire. Basically, late breaking demand, problem probably in the way the product was built, a defect that's really affecting us now. And they made space for that to say, hey, over here is the X lane. The X lane is for the expedite. If it's on fire, we got to deal with it. And we assume that it's 21 days or less in terms of us doing that. The fun thing is in the bottom right corner, I really encourage people to do this. They have the done area for the things they really love. They got out the door. So features they love, they had a little trophy cabinet, which is actually really powerful. So this is kind of how it looked. They actually would load up the backlog. Uh, there was no limit here for the feature backlog. And then they would load them into the top 10. These are the product owners and the stakeholders primarily saying, yeah, these are the things we really want to get done. And then if the team had capacity, they would then pick the first one, two or three, they'd bring them over. And what they would be doing here is breaking down the features into user stories. The bet that they made was, effectively they could pull a feature in, break it down and deliver it in 21 days or less. And they had ways to mitigate that. But you can see here now, they actually have a whip limit in place to pull work through uh, for in progress, test, deploy and accept. So they had three features, uh, sorry, limit of three stories basically, or features in progress, a limit of three stories for testing, a limit of two uh, features for basically um, deployment and then finally five for uh, the acceptance test. And this is kind of how the board looked actually. So you can see here, they've got pretty much a nice little layout here of the features in the top left, uh, as well as the top 10 on the top left. And then all the way to your right are basically a breakdown of the features into user stories. And you can see how this loads up more or less into a very uh, detailed picture of what they're trying to get out the door. And one thing they did to kind of keep the the acceptance testing working, they had a nice little uh, turbo charge here of basically saying, let's put a whip limit on this so that if we basically don't finish this work, if the user acceptance test doesn't happen, we can continue to do other work in the meantime. But as time goes on, if that work still isn't accepted, then deployment will probably stop because deployment is done. QA will probably finish their work and test and then they'll wait. 
and then the work in progress will eventually become finished and they'll wait. So this actually shows a sign of pressure building up on the user acceptance test, but it's also a visual element too. So keep in mind, one of the key things here is that um, the acceptance column and the board itself set between the coffee machine in the office and the offices of the executives. So the executives got to walk by this board every time they wanted to get a cup of coffee. And sometimes they would actually look at the acceptance column and they were told to basically to keep an eye on that. So if something didn't move there, they'd reach a hand out, uh, basically wave a hand at the uh, product owner and say, hey, have you accepted that story yet? So there was always kind of this nice pressure uh, being placed on the product owner to finish accepting that work. There was also, again, this whip limit here for deployment which actually allowed deployment to run more smoothly. So they didn't have to overly focus on too many things and trying to get too much done. Two was a nice number for them. And last but not least within the uh, testing piece, the testing group actually had a whip limit of three because that actually allowed them to stay focused on testing out certain clinical components of the software to make sure it was valid. So this actually allowed for smoothness to happen right here uh, for the layout. And last but not least, we talked about the, uh, the expedite thing. This is something that had a due date attached to it. So it was due by a certain date. It's a feature they wanted out or a bug they wanted to have fixed. They didn't get it started early. And so it got elevated to the highest focus. They said, okay, we need to make sure we, we solve this one right now, but we don't want expedites typically. But this allowed for that to happen so they can go back and learn and say, how do we prevent expedites from occurring again? We wanna try and reduce the frequency of gotchas basically. So uh, back to the challenge briefly right here. Um, again, we want change to look like this. Uh, we believe we're gonna end up right around here. Uh, but as we start to play with change, we realize we're gonna dip down pretty hard. The bigger the thing that you wanna do, the harder the change possibly, the more time it takes to work through it. And so you lose that safety, you lose that patience uh, and you can quite likely fail here. So I wanted to follow back up really briefly with the positive science. When they actually did those turbochargers, they found that everything started to work a lot more smoothly. They found that they were able to deliver software in a reliable manner. Uh, that's something we didn't get the chance to cover today. Uh, but they did use those turbochargers, so that's kind of how it worked for them. So instead of trying to say, let's do all these things all at once under like two months time frame, they said, okay, let's try and add things in and see which things really work for us and try to evolve little by little with these turbocharge approaches to go just from typically doing Scrum to something maybe more than what we uh, intended on with Scrum to really what fits for our market and what fits for our need for delivery.